Good morning, everybody. I'm Father Chris Alar, and welcome to actually the 152nd Explaining the Faith Talk, where I've been honored to be able to take you back to seminary with me, the best time of my life, grabbing the notes. But today was a topic I never learned in seminary. So I got the assistance of our theologian, Chris Sparks, and I've done some research on, and what we're about to talk about today is so timely, so amazing. And so you're gonna hear about this in a moment. You saw the title slide, it's called Our Lady. Now, Mark Goring just did a video on this and he called it Zytun. And I just heard last night, that, and this must mean something, because I didn't have any idea these two were doing it. And I really respect Mark Goring, and I really respect Jimmy Aiken. And Jimmy Aiken just did a talk on this yesterday, and he calls it Zaytun. So please, whatever my pronunciation is, have mercy on me, because we'll go with Zaytun, and kind of like iTunes, that's how you can remember, but this is much more important than iTunes. And so we're also gonna make a couple comments about the Eucharistic proposed apparition of Mary on the Eucharist in California. And then a lot of you have been asking me, Father Chris, you mentioned a bunch of weeping statues and oozing oil. Where was that? What's the name of that? And I apologize, I mistakenly said the Philippines. I've been all over the world so many times. It was actually Samoa. And we're gonna show a video of hundreds of statues and every single one was pouring oil. Every single one. Never saw anything like it. I was there in May, but I've just never, never brought it forward. I just, didn't, I just didn't feel it was necessary to bring forward, but now I feel the Holy Spirit saying, show this because now is the time of Mary. And so we are getting ready and we're gonna explain all of this after we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us to open our minds and hearts to receive the grace you wish to bestow upon us, and through the intercession of Our Lady of Zaytun, may we be protected, guided, and blessed, and always led to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't even know where to begin. There is so many incredible things to talk about. Let me, let me start with one. A lot of you have written to me about the uh, appearance of what looked like Mary in the Eucharist, in my Mary in the Eucharist retreat that I did out in California. And I stated several follow-up times and homilies and videos that we are not claiming we know the origin. I, I don't know if it was a reflection, if she was on the host, if it's natural, if it's supernatural, but I'm gonna tell you this. We just received an email from a woman who was there and she was seated in the pew kneeling right in front of this giant monstrance, about five to six feet tall. And she was so amazed at the size of this monstrance and the beauty of this monstrance that throughout the night of prayer she was taking pictures. So she sent us this time-stamped picture and in the picture, at, and I can't remember the exact times, but like 9, 9.25 she took a picture. There was no, no image of Mary. She stayed in the exact same position, exact same pew, kneeling in the exact same position. She took another picture at like 9.40, no image of Mary. She took another picture, these are time stamped, at like 9.58, no Mary. All of a sudden, she took the picture at 10 o'clock, and there was Mary. Now, if it's a reflection, I thought, well, maybe the sun between 9.30 and 10 o'clock moved to cause a reflection, but it was at night. There was no sun. And so again, we're not claiming miracle. We're not claiming supernatural. We don't know. The bishop has not commented. The bishop has not looked at this. I just wanted to share that with you. And that's important. Now, the other thing, a lot of you said, Father, you talked about this area of weeping images and oil oozing from statues all over in one chapel. And I accidentally said Philippines. It was actually Samoa, when I was there for the World Apostolic Congress on Mercy. Now, let's have Brother Mark go to the first slide. As you can see, the place is called the Chapel of the Sacred Oil. 
This is the sign right in front, and it's fully established through the diocese. This is fully approved. Let's take a look at our next slide. This is Mary's hand. Look at the oil. Every single statue, and I think there were 400, are oozing oil. Let's take a look at our next slide. The next slide is Mary. Look at her chin. Look at her chin, the oil that is running down from her tears onto her chin. I was there. I saw this. I took these pictures. These are not off the internet. These are pictures I took. Next, we're going to show you a quick two-minute video where I took the camera and walked around to these images. So please, let's now watch this quick video of these statues. Okay, I am here in Samoa at in the name of the place? Sanctuary. Sanctuary of the most sacred oil. And these are all statues. Here's the Blessed Sacrament present. These are all statues that are oozing oil. And we can see here in our Blessed Mother, watch this. You can see the oil. And look. This is amazing. The sacred heart of Jesus, yes. Wow. And the sacred heart of Jesus. Oil here, the hand. Look at the that name. oil. Oh my. And here, oil. And look at, look at the oil that has fallen. Can we bless this oil, uh, be blessed with this oil? This is amazing. And Jesus here, and the cross as well. And the cross, Jesus. the cross is oozing as well. So, man, man. Yes. This is These are all statues that are oozing oils. These are all oils that they're collecting, and we can be blessed with these oils. This is amazing. And the rosary as well. The and this rosary. is the rosary in oil. The rosary oozed oil? Yes. Oozed the rosary oil. oozed and oil. This, this one as well. and, uh, These are amazing. And this is from our Blessed Mother's hands. This is, see her, the oil. See the oil on her hand. And this is the oil that is collected. I've never, I've never seen a place like this ever. Amazing. And here is the tabernacle. You can see the oil coming from the tabernacle, and it's collected here. Okay, so as you can see in that video, that was me talking. I was the one going around. I was in awe of seeing every one of these statues weeping, oozing oil, and there were hundreds, hundreds of them. And so I'll keep this video up if you wish to share it. Amazing. Now, let's talk about Mary becoming even more present in today's world. Today, we are going to talk about Zaitun, Our Lady of Zaitun. Now, this is in Egypt. Now, You've heard me say that Einsiden, I believe, is the greatest awe-inspiring, and we're going there, if you were to, to join us on pilgrimage, two days after Divine Mercy Sunday. What a way to celebrate. We're going there. That is the most awe-inspiring of all apparitions I've ever seen or heard of, but it involved Christ and the heavenly court. Now, Mark Goring who you all know, I think is a great priest. He said, Zaitun, though, is the most impressive appearance of Blessed Virgin Mary in the history of the church. Those are his words. And what we have with us in these pictures and what we're going to share with you on the internet or on the uh, live stream is what happened. All right. First of all, 
We, in 1918, Abraham Khalil was a pious Orthodox Coptic. Now, Coptic is Christian, but there is Coptic Catholics, and then there's Coptic Orthodox. Okay, now, he was an Orthodox Coptic, and he owned some land in Zaytun, and he was visited by the Blessed Virgin in a dream. Our Lady told him to build a Coptic church, okay, honoring her on this land. This is very rare. All right, promising she would bless it 50 years later. This was 1918. Now the church was built, and Mary kept her promise. 50 years exactly later, Mary appeared, and she appeared over 90 times at St. Mary's Coptic Church from April 2nd, 1968 to May 1971. Now, those in person, you can see me. I'm going to talk about these apparitions in a minute. And then the you online, I'll also show you. Now, let's go to our first slide. As you can see, there's the church on the left. And on the right is Mary on the dome of the church, like Notre Dame. Now, I've got to pray for Notre Dame. So... So Mary appeared there over 90 times, starting on April 2nd, 1968. Now let's go to our next slide. This is the image that they saw, a luminous female figure atop the roof of St. Mary's Orthodox Church, the Coptic Church in Zaytun, a suburb of Cairo. At least one million Egyptians saw her. And many foreigners, guess what? There were Muslims, Jews, Catholics, and Protestants. What is the world trying to do right now? Muslims and Jews, peace. We need peace. Catholics and Protestants, we need peace. So all of a sudden, Mary brings them all together here. Now, what's ironic is this was right after the Six-Day War, the war between Israel and Egypt. I'm going to get into this whole connection here. It's absolutely amazing. And when I started doing this talk, I had no idea Mark Goring and, and Jimmy Aiken were going to be talking on this. This is, this is the Holy Spirit. Now, many Muslims, Catholics, uh, Jews, Protestants, and even non-believers saw her. Then, in 2017, Pope Francis <clears throat> became only the second pope to visit Egypt after John Paul II. Now, what is Egypt? The largest Arab country. It's Muslim majority, and many Christians who are in the minority are persecuted there. Now, Egypt is critically important in the Bible. Why? The book of Exodus, the escape from Egypt, and the Holy Family, when they were trying to escape Herod, where did they flee? Egypt. Egypt. We're going to talk about more of that in a minute. But less known to us Christians in the West, though, is what happened at Zaytun. Now, on April 2nd, 1968, Farouk Mohammed Atwa, a Muslim mechanic, car mechanic, Mary works through the humble, was working across the street from St. Mary's and suddenly saw a beautiful young woman standing on the church rooftop. Brother Mark just showed you online some of the pictures you here in person can see. Now, he thought, let's go to our next picture online. He believed that she was about to commit suicide. So he ran to get help. And a crowd of onlookers gathered around the church. He thought this was a woman going to jump. That she was going to take her life. So many people saw her, but then she vanished. Now the apparitions continued very frequently, most on feast days, some lasting several minutes, even up to a few hours. And they continued into 1971, and this is very critically important why those dates matter. Now, we're going to show you one more video. This is the only other video. It's just over two minutes. And this video captures great the scene, and we actually have the video of what happened at Zytun. So let's watch this two-minute video. Egypt, 1968, an estimated one million eyewitnesses claimed to see the vision of a woman 
hovering over this church in Zaitun. Two mechanics working at night thought they saw a nun preparing to commit suicide. They ran for a priest who realized that what they were seeing may be more fantastic than they could have possibly imagined. The priest ran and came quickly, and of course, he realized what was going on. She was not standing on the roof, she was standing in the air. Carrie Mellick is a doctor living in Rockville, Maryland. He was in Egypt at the time and saw for himself what many believe was hovering above the church. I saw a light in the southwest dome. This light began to increase immensely, and suddenly I saw the Virgin Mary standing in front of the dome. These are actual photographs taken at Zaitun. Mary is said to be the sphere of light at the top. According to legend, Zaitun is where Mary Joseph and the baby Jesus once sought refuge. Whatever it is we are seeing here, Malik was not alone in witnessing this alleged apparition firsthand. Everyone in the field of vision saw her. Whether he's a Christian, a Muslim, a good man, a bad man, whoever. Everyone in the field of vision saw her. We interviewed uh, over 100 uh, witnesses, uh, and many, most of these witnesses, we do not believe even know each other, but yet they gave very, very similar accounts of what they saw. John Jackson has been studying the Zaitun photographs for many years. I can't see any inconsistencies in these photographs, and they look uh, as though they are recording an actual event. And then the photographic records uh, correlate very nicely with what the eyewitnesses uh, claim that they have seen. The apparitions lasted four years and left an enduring impression on all who were there. I describe myself as a, a, a person who uses logic and, and thinks rationally. I am a scientist, but uh, you can't deny what you see with your own eyes. Okay, what a, a thorough video. I, I'm sorry to play another longer video, but that's all we have today for videos. But that gives you an idea of what was going on. And the beautiful thing being in 1968, we had modern technology. We had television. We had, we had cameras, and they were able to capture this. Now, many witnesses recall that Mary was holding an olive branch, obviously a symbol of peace that is so desperately needed in the Middle East back then they just had finished a war between Israel and Egypt. And today, what's going on in the Holy Land? I tell you, there is not going to be peace. Who is battling in the Holy Land? Islam and the Jews. The three major religions of the world, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, even though Catholicism is the real actual denomination, but we put Christianity together. All over a billion, the Jews and the Muslims reject Christ, the Prince of Peace. Christ is the Prince of Peace. Until we acknowledge him and we keep rejecting him, there will not be peace, especially in the Middle East, where the Jews are trying to live with and the Muslims are trying to live with each other. Now, <clears throat> there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace is acknowledged. Now, Mary appeared, blessing the crowds, bowing in front of the cross of the church, and walking across the church's domes. Now, let's take a look at our next picture. Look at this actual picture of the crowd. This is 250,000 people who were present, and they all saw it. They all saw it absolutely amazing. And these pictures that I have here in the shrine are what they saw. You can see the top of the church. Now what's interesting is you see the one picture of Mary, there appears to be a dove above her. Doves appeared when Mary appeared. But the windows upstairs, everybody said, oh, well, they, somebody just opened up the window and threw a dove out. <laughs> well, first of all, the doves were illuminated and they were flying at night. Doves don't fly at night. Secondly, 
The windows are all sealed. There's no way for somebody to have opened that window and released doves. So now, this is what's going on. Now, in addition, let's go to our next slide with Brother Mary, if we can see this picture of Mary. Mary saw these doves. This is what we wanted to show. So Brother Mark, if you could see the dove above her head, they're flying at night, like I said, which these birds don't really do. But the appearance also had bright flashing colors, just like Mary at Fatima. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Mary was seen just like Fatima with St. Joseph. She was cradling Jesus, who appeared to be about 12 years old. Now, many also recalled smelling incense at Zaytun. Now, that's what happened in Lourdes. Many miraculous healings were confirmed here, just like Lourdes. And many were non-Christian medical professionals who recorded it. Now, remember that auto mechanic, the Muslim? He had his finger all bandaged, and it was all cut up because they were amputating it the next day. Because he had gain green. And his finger was basically withered away. And what little bit was left of it, they were going to amputate the next day. It was that wrapped up finger. He was the first man to see Mary. And he pointed to Mary up on the roof with that finger. And instantly that finger was healed. Instantly. Instantly. And so there's many miracles. Now, <clears throat> these miracles are just like Lord's. Now here, Mary also said nothing. She was silent, just like Knock. I was just in Knock in Ireland. And I gave the whole meaning of the message of Knock. And so many people were local there. They're like, Father, we've never heard this message. All we were told is Mary didn't talk. Well, the fact that Mary didn't talk, but what happened with St. Joseph and St. John is incredible. To this day, I think that was the most inspired talk I've ever done. It was not recorded. But what happened at Knock, all of a sudden, I just felt the words just, I, I didn't even know what I was saying. They were just, the words was just coming out of my mouth, what the message was at Knock. Here was the same thing. Mary didn't say anything. She was silent. But there were so many conversions. You know who most of the conversions were? Muslim. And who's the only woman mentioned in the Quran? Mary. Now, it's not necessarily our Mary. Because in the Quran, Mary's a Jew. I mean, a, oh, <laughs> a Muslim. <clears throat> I don't want to start a war, please. I don't want to start a war. Oh my, oh my. So, it, but there is a connection there with Our Lady. Now, the crowd started to concern the government and the police. So what did the Egyptian police do? I explained this to the group while we were watching the video, but for those of you at home, they ordered a blackout. And so they, they wanted to prove that somebody had some mechanical devices, some spotlights that were flashing up on the top to show Mary. So they ordered a blackout of the entire region of this area of Cairo. And as the blackout hit and it was completely black, Mary got brighter. So she began to even be brighter. Now, they could find no lighting, no projector, no devices of any kind for 15 miles around. And the Egyptian newspapers then started to notice. And they began to publish photos. And Mary went on TV. She was on Egyptian television, broadcasted the video footage of her. Now, in America, it really wasn't... Let's, let, let, let me show you one article. This is all I could find. This is the Sunday World Herald. And this is in Omaha, Nebraska, one of the best dioceses in the entire United States of America. This is the only one I could find of a record in the archives of a story in the United States posted about Mary appearing, even though she was on Egyptian television. This is amazing. Now, papers in Europe and in America, they were preoccupied with the Vietnam War. The sexual revolution, student protests, the Soviets invading Czechoslovakia. They weren't really interested in this. So people could say, well, Father, if Mary was on TV in Egypt, why didn't we hear about it in the United States? It's because people were preoccupied. Now, Egypt, this is interesting. Egypt's second president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, 
who was a practicing Sunni Muslim, was there to witness the apparitions and stated he believes. So the Coptic church quickly recognized these apparitions and declared it miraculous. Okay? Now, what about our church? The Latin rite, the Vatican. Okay, let's go to our next slide. Here's Paul VI. He sent two envoys to Zaytun. And while the Pope got totally favorable accounts to the Vatican from what happened, from interviews and studies in the science, the Vatican never officially commented on it because they said it occurred in an Orthodox church. So the, the Vatican never commented on this, but the reason I'm showing it is because it was fully approved in the Coptic church. And so this is the only apparition I'm going outside, but I believe the Vatican was amazed by it. They fully supported it. Now, many Egyptian cops, both Orthodox and Catholics, found this very moving. All right, now, <clears throat> thousands of people from different denominations, religions came, Egyptians, foreigners, clergy, scientists, different classes, rich, poor, they all saw it. Everyone was stunned, and no one could find a scientific explanation. Nobody. It came at a time, as I said, when the Middle East was in turmoil, even usually always is, but especially at that time and especially today. But it gave hope in this time of darkness. You know what I believe that shutting off the whole lights? I believe that this is a precursor to the three days of darkness. And I'm going to be talking about that in my homily at 2 o'clock. At, at two o'clock. So I really believe, and who was the light in the darkness? Mary. So this, these extraordinary appari apparitions of Mary are significant for everybody. <clears throat> Those who saw it, it reminded us of Mary in the book of Revelation. Silence, reverence, and faith. And this went on for three years, and guess what? They never caught a hoaxer. No equipment was ever found. No hoax was ever discovered, nothing. Now, there's a good article by John Berger that is online that I wanted to talk about. It's called Blood and Water, Unite Catholics and Coptics. Um, listen to this. This is interesting. Now, the Coptic Christians are the spiritual children of those of us in the church. They separated. Everybody thinks there were two great separations, right? When was the Protestant Reformation? 1519, okay. When was the first great schism? 1054, when the Orthodox split from the Catholic Church, right? They are no longer under the papacy, although we believe in their sacraments. We believe they have apostolic succession. You ever seen an Orthodox liturgy, an Eastern Orthodox liturgy? Beautiful. But people forget there was another separation in the fourth century in Egypt, the Coptics. The Coptic Christians separated in the fourth century, taking a different view of the nature of Christ. But they're not Arabs. They're not Arabs. They're Christians. As such, they are classified as Oriental Orthodox not Eastern Orthodox that we think of, like the Russian Orthodox or the Greek Orthodox that we see with the long beards and the, and the square hats. These <clears throat> are what we call Oriental Orthodox. And the relationship between Rome and Alexandria, because that's where they're based, has been turbulent. And the re relationship has become even more important over the recent times with, with militant Islam especially with the killing of Christians. Now, before the Islamic State, before we knew on the news about the crimes and everything, Coptic churches throughout Egypt were being attacked. We never hear about it. We never hear about it. We have a family here from North Carolina. When I was in North Carolina, somebody thought a racial slur was used, and it made not only national news, worldwide news. They found out it was all a hoax. That made news across the whole world. They determined it was a hoax. Somebody left a, 
uh, a string in there to actually open the garage door and it was proven because they found a video that it was there well before this race car driver who they accused, he accused of being racist was found. It was a complete hoax, but it made, it made worldwide news. Yet Coptic Christians are being slaughtered and beheaded and we do not hear a single word. Not a single word. We saw those dramatic images of ISIS. I, I was going to show it, and I just couldn't. Leading the 21 orange-clad Coptics out on the beach. I don't know if you saw this. They were wearing orange jumpsuits. And they were led out on the beach in Libya. And they were all beheaded on video. I wasn't going to show that. But a picture of the men lined up who refused to deny Christ. Those men are in heaven. All 21. Pray to them because they can be one heck of an intercessor for us. Somebody willing to literally lose their head to not deny Christ. And so anyway, this is what's happening now. So Catholics and Oriental Orthodox, we've got to reunite we have to stand together, unity. And this is what Our Lady is telling us here. She's appearing in an Arab country. And now with the war flashing again between the Arabs and, and Jews, and now Christians are involved, this message is more important than ever. Many consider the apparitions of Mary as something else as well. This is fascinating. This is absolutely fascinating. Many believe what we're looking at here is Mary's return to Zaytun. What do I mean by that? This is the place where the Holy Family stayed during their flight to Egypt. This is where Jesus, Mary, and Joseph stayed. Now here's what's fascinating. Let's take a look at our next slide, if Brother Mark can show. This is a picture of the flight to Egypt. Now, why did Mary and Joseph flee Egypt, I mean to Egypt. The killing of innocent children. Now, here's what I think is fascinating. Mark Goring talked about this. I had this written separately. I couldn't believe it when I came across this video. I'm like, the Holy Spirit is moving. Mary and Joseph fled to Egypt because of the killing of innocent children. Do you know when did this apparition happen? 1968 to 1971. Do you know 1968 to 1971 was the exact time frame for the mass legalization of abortion? The killing of innocent life. In April 1968, the exact month Mary appeared, the United Kingdom enacted the Abortion Act that opened up the dam that flooded the world and that paved the way for Roe v. Wade. The United Kingdom. The dowry of Mary. I just was in London. I was at the Westminster Cathedral. There were so many people there that we couldn't fit them into the talk. There were 250 people outside. So I'm trying to scream my talk. You think I'm annoying now? <laughs> You should have heard me then. <laughs> and I believe that it started with the United Kingdom. It's got to go through the United Kingdom. And so in 1968, April, the exact month Mary appeared, the United Kingdom enacted the Abortion Act, and that opened up the floodgates. Then it came to the United States with Roe v. Wade, and guess when Roe v. Wade was first argued? 1971. The final hearing was 73, but it was first argued in 71. Take a guess when. The same month Mary stopped appearing. Unbelievable. This is the beginning. Roe v. Wade and the Abortion Act of the UK is the beginning of Herod's slaughter of the innocent on a global and ap uh, apocalyptic scale. This is unbelievable. You know, I got a few minutes. I've only talked about this once. I'm going to tell you something about Father Seraphim, God rest his soul. 
I'm stealing from Father Seraphim's talk at the Healthcare Professionals for Divine Mercy, a great group led by Marie Romagnano. In November 2020, he died shortly after. It was his last public talk. Listen to what Father Seraphim said. The devil hates God's mercy more than anything because mercy is behind the creation of man. In his pride, the devil can't stand the very inception of human life, the fruit of mercy. The fruit of mercy is life. I'm reading Father Seraphim's exact words here. Because Jesus resurrected, the devil cannot harm the Savior. So he attacks those in his image and likeness. The main way he does this is to get us to take life and end it. Suicide, euthanasia, and especially abortion. St. Faustina, Diary 1276. Listen to this. This is Faustina talking. At eight o'clock, I was seized with such violent pains that I had to go to bed at once. I was convulsed with pain for three hours, that is until 11 o'clock at night. At times, the pains caused me to lose consciousness. Jesus had me realize that in this way I took part in his agony in the garden and that he himself allowed these sufferings in order to offer reparation to God for the souls murdered in the wombs of wicked mothers. These are the words of St. Faustina. No medicine can lessen these sufferings. And I don't know whether I'll ever again ever suffer in this way. I leave that to God. What it pleases God to send, I will accept with submission and love. If only I could save even one soul from murder by means of these sufferings. One of the most powerful paragraphs in the diary. Now, where am I going with this? I shouldn't say where am I going with it. Where did Seraphim go with it? Connected with these, this reading was diary number 39. Here's diary 39. On one day, Jesus told me that he would cause a chastisement to fall upon the most beautiful city in our country. What country? Poland. This chastisement would be that which God had punished Sodom and Gomorrah. I saw the great wrath of God and a shudder pierced my heart. I prayed in silence. Now, these are the words of St. Faustina. After a moment, Jesus said to me, my child, unite yourself closely to me during the sacrifice and offer my blood. What sacrifice? The mass. And offer my blood in my wounds to my father in expiation for the sins of that city. Repeat this without interruption throughout the entire holy mass. Do this for seven days. Faustina then said, when I saw the kindness of Jesus, I began to beg his blessing. Immediately, Jesus said, for your sake, I bless the entire country. Did you hear that? For the sake of one person, he blessed the entire nation. Who here will be willing to do this to bless the United States? Or if you're listening from the Philippines, or South Africa, or Ireland, or England, or Australia, or Canada, are you willing to do this? For your sake, I bless the entire country. And he made a big sign of the cross over our country. Now here's what Seraphim said. This is fascinating. With regard to this incident, Sister Faustina's confessor, Blessed Michael Sapochko, gave sworn testimony during her beatification process. We have this in writing. She wrote in her diary that Jesus himself was about to destroy one of the most beautiful cities in our country, 
like Sodom and Gomorrah on account of the crimes committed there. We just read it. Okay, you heard it, right? Having read these things in her diary, which is what I just read you, I asked her what this prophecy meant. This is Sapochko talking, her confessor. She answered, confirming the things she wrote and responding on account of what sins God would inflict these punishments. She replied, and this is a quote, this is not in the diary, this is what Blessed Michael Sapochko wrote in his writings, quoting Sister F St. Faustina. She replied, it is on account of the massacre of infants not yet born, the most grievous crime of all. Now, what city, he asked her, was Jesus talking about? She answered, Warsaw. Now, why, he asked her, because Warsaw was the most prominent center for providing abortions in all of Europe. And guess what? Did you remember reading when she got those pains? At 8 o'clock, I was seized with violent pains that I had to go to bed. I was convulsed with pain for three hours until 11 o'clock at night. That's in the diary. Here's what she told Sapochko. She had the pains between 11, excuse me, 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. Do you know that that's when they did the abortions at the clinic in Warsaw? Between 8 and 11 p.m. Unbelievable. Now, I want to finish with this. I got three minutes. This is one of the most incredible things I ever heard Father Seraphim say. The chaplet of divine mercy was given as a prayer to end abortion. How do we know this? Paragraph 474 of the diary. Paragraph 474. Here's what Jesus said. No, I'm sorry, Faustina. In the evening, when I was in my cell, I saw an angel, the executor of divine wrath. From a cloud, bolts of thunder and flashes of lightning were springing into his hands. Now, this isn't my joyful Saturday writings. This is St. Faustina in the diary. Lightning was springing from his hands, and from his hand there were going forth, and only then were they striking the earth, or going to strike the earth. When I saw this sign of divine wrath, which was about to strike the earth, and in particular a certain place, Warsaw, I began to implore the angel to hold off for a few moments, and the world would do penance. So here it is. St. Faustina sees this wrath coming, and she begs God, I implored him, the angel, to hold off for a few minutes so the world could do penance. But my plea was a mere nothing in the face of divine anger. Just then, I saw the most holy trinity. I'm reading from paragraph 474 in the diary of St. Faustina. Just then, I saw the most holy trinity. At that very moment, I felt my soul, I felt in my soul, the power of Jesus' grace which dwells in my soul. When I became conscious of this grace, I was instantly snatched up before the throne of God. I found myself pleading with God for the world with words that I heard interiorly. As I was praying in this manner, I saw the angel's helplessness. Now, what is the angel striking? Warsaw. What did St. Faustina say was the sin of Warsaw? Abortion. Now, St. Faustina says, I heard these words interiorly. And when she prayed these words, I saw the angel helpless. He could not carry out the punishment, which was rightly due for those sins. Never before had I prayed with such inner power as I did then. Guess what the next paragraph, 475, gives? The words of the divine mercy 
chaplet. Then go to the next paragraph, 476. The next morning when I entered the chapel, I heard these words interiorly. Every time you enter the chapel, immediately recite the prayer which I taught you yesterday. What prayer? What prayer? Divine Mercy Chaplet. These words were the chaplet of divine mercy. And in light of the testimony of St. Faustina's confessor, Michael Sapochko, it would seem that this prayer, the chaplet of divine mercy, this is the words of Father Seraphim, was revealed particularly to counteract the scourge that we are owed for the crime of abortion. I've always asked the Lord why he has not crushed us yet. I've always asked the Lord why he has not crushed us and why does he continue to allow us to go on and on? And you know what the answer is? The chaplet of divine mercy. This is the answer. This is the message. Now stay with us because I'm overdue here. I'm going to go, Brother Mark is going to power down for you at home. Brother Mark is going to power down this recording of this talk. I'm going to go vest. We're going to come up. We're going to clear everything away. We're going to expose the Blessed Sacrament. And we're going to begin the first Saturday devotions. And I'm going to explain to you how that all connects. Because right now, it's all together. We are in the middle of a critical time. Today is a first Saturday, and we're also in the octave of All Saints Day. And on the retreat group, I will explain to you later today the significance of the octave of All Saints Day. These eight days, go to the cemetery. We're going to talk about that more. But God bless all of you and recognize the power of the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. God bless you.